Over the years, people learned a few things about firearms. Number one, yes, your powder will blow out of your pan. Therefore, they made a cover for the pan and a groove so that when you load the powder <coughs> into the pan, you can drop your weapon and wait in readiness and the powder won't fall out. Um, it's actually some more protection against it being wet than the match lock head. Um, we've gone to a different, uh, a little less time consuming method of ignition. We're using a piece of stone, striking a piece of steel, which creates sparks. Not necessarily as immediately reliable as the slow match, but much more faster um, for the time period because we, instead of two shots per minute, we can now get off three. So um, the armies back then went by something called rate of fire. The more lead you could put down range, the better for you. Um, powder quality, better, but not as, it's still not consistent. So you have these long lines of um, musket men, uh, infantry, that are all lined up there firing all at the same block the same way against them. Very what we consider close ranges. <coughs> but the powder's not reliable. It's dirty. So what you have is a lot of fouling in your barrel. So this is a 62 caliber French trade gun. If I'm using this for deer hunting or something, it's not bad. I'm only firing one or two shots. This is a civilian model. Um, the militia use these as a military weapon also, um, but the powder will follow the barrel. So if I have a 62 caliber musket, um, by the time I've fired four or five shots, I'm down to using a 50 caliber ball in here to make sure that I have, am able to jam it down. The issue with that is that uh, if, if for some reason that foul intends to clear, that ball is bouncing around like a marble in a large PVC tube. When it comes out the end of the barrel, you don't know where it's going to go. If I'm aiming in this direction, it could go that way, it could go that way. If you go up, it could go down. So you needed these long lines of soldiers all firing in the same direction to make sure something actually hit. So when you see a movie like The Patriot and you think, well, that's ridiculous. Why are they all lined up like that so close together in one big line? That's the reason why. You had to do it with the state of the art back then. Um, as a civilian weapon, when you're using this, um, pipes were still very much an important part of the military um, presence back then. To, uh, you know, you have, a, you have a mixed ratio of pikemen to uh, musketeers or people using an arc weapon. The uh, French and Indian War, Revolutionary War, you don't have pikes really so much anymore. It's more a symbol of uh, a sergeant or an officer. What we've used was bayonets. To use a bayonet in something like this, I would steal my wife's best butcher knife. I would file the handle down so it would fit in here. And when I ran out of powder, musket balls, or the enemy was too close to firing anymore, I would take her knife and I would jam it down my barrel and now I have a pike. The problem with this is I'm not going to go home to a very happy wife. And now my musket can no longer be used to fire anything. I have just plugged the barrel. Um, later military advances made some changes to that. So the problem with uh, the flint and steel is again, your slow match is still um, it's, it's always lit. It's, it's going to hit that powder and it's going to go off. The flint and steel, I'm striking a spark into a pan and I'm hoping I didn't put too much powder in there. If you put too much powder in there, you're just going to stand there until it finally goes through the touch hole and fires. Or I didn't put enough powder in there and it's just never going to hit the touch hole. So there's a fine line there. Uh, Moisture, high humidity, things like that are going to stop my powder from going off. So we always tended to keep things safe. Um, you're going to have sparks. If you're in a military lineup, these sparks, you're shoulder to shoulder with somebody else, and you're firing, I have to watch out for my sparks and powder hitting his face. Got
that powder was very dirty. So if you got a powder burn on your face, a lot of people died from the following infections. The burn wasn't so bad, they could cure the burn. It was the infection afterward. There's no antibiotics. So you treated it with a poultice of whatever your granny thought was good, which wasn't always good. <laughs> Shortly, during the time of the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, we discovered that there's a new way to make a bayonet. We can actually make a ring and attach a bayonet to a lug on the barrel. And with a fixed bayonet, I can still fire. I would imagine that the first time that uh, these were used against enemy troops, that they said, they're fixing bayonets. They're out of power. And they came running up to take advantage of that fact and these guys fired, it was a big surprise. Pretty soon, by the Revolutionary War, that is the state of art. The bayonet was still the deciding factor in most military battles during the Revolutionary War. Whoever was able to stand their ground, fix bayonets, and charge won the battle. Powder was so bad that George Washington's troops were firing on the attacking British. They were within 25 yards of each other, and the American powder was so bad that the bullets were bouncing off the British soldiers' uniforms. So, once we uh, started getting better powder and we were able to, to do some better things, we actually started to turn the war. It wasn't until we got the German, uh, in, the Germans in to train us in marching and drill techniques, and we got some French assistance that we were able to actually start to turn the tide and be able to do things. Vive la Vive l'Empereur. So, the uh, Revolutionary War, if you look at a civilian musket versus a military musket, this is a shorter Charleville, or this is a brown bess. This is uh, the shorter brown bess. They're about the same size. Brown bess is fired a 75 caliber ball. That's the difference between a 20 gauge shotgun and a 12 gauge shotgun. Still smooth bore. We're not using so much rifling back then. They did have some, but your riflemen were back down to a lower rate of fire. You were getting off a shot a minute. It's a rifle barrel. You have to jam that ball through the rifling to actually get it down there seated so you can actually fire. So riflemen were specialty troops. They didn't use a lot of them. They were the snipers. They were the, uh, the scouts, things like that. They were the ones that hit the kids, shot the officers, so the regular troops didn't know what to do. British troops were so well trained that if they were marching into fire and you shot the officers, they would continue to march until they died. They were so well trained that there are actual um, muskets and uh, found on battlefields that have six or seven musket balls and powder charges in them because if it didn't go off, you didn't have time to go, hey, mine didn't go off, what do I do? You just grinded and loaded and kept on going. So there are there are instances where as you're marching, finally one of those charges ignites and your musket blows up. So but they were trained so well trained that he'd fall down and this guy would step over and they'd keep marching. Um, there were battles, actual battles, where American troops killed off the officers and the jerk the, the English and German troops march right into the oncoming fire and they, they didn't fix bayonets because nobody told them to. They didn't do anything except keep marching forward because that was the last order they were given. And you know, that's the way military tactics were back then. Do you have anything you want to add? Yes. Okay, I'll call you the order. Prime load, come to the ready. So the same exact thing when you prime and load is the same, that fancy pants did back there. The only difference is we don't have a rope. Uh, and he doesn't have, we don't have little funny wooden black things, we have little baggies. And this bag that's where the powder and the ball went. So, uh, to be in the army, or any type of military service at that time, you have to have two teeth, top and a bottom, enough to rip off the top of the paper, and then spit out your best friend. Then pour it in the pan, And then you shut it. Cast the belt down the barrel. Same 
exact thing. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. That's fine. Now you just wait for the order to fire. Make ready. Take aim. Fire. That happened. That's why there's a whole lot of them. Let's try again. Take aim. Fire. I ain't the only one. <laughs> Maybe? Question mark. There we go! <laughs> See, you just have to not do it together. <laughs> you do that over and over and over again until the batter's all battles over or you're dead. That's usually how it works. <laughs> the next improvement for everybody.